Thank you for joining us today for a discussion on preparing for a dynamic future of work. I'm joined today by Amy Loomis, IDC Research Director, Future of Work, Eric Chetwind, Everbridge Senior Director, Product Marketing, and I'm Krista Ancri, Vice President of Marketing with Everbridge as well. Let's get started. Uh, Amy, I'll turn it over to you to, to begin our discussion. Thanks, Krista. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really hoping that everybody has a lot of interest in this because it is the thing that we have to prepare for. So our future is going to be dynamic. There's no question about it. And the first part of our conversation, I'd like to really focus around how do we build resiliency in the face of that dynamic future? Because we're going to have to meet business challenges, not just the ones we know about today, but the ones that are coming tomorrow. And then I'd like to shift gears and have us talk a little bit about what does it mean to have hybrid work and that sense of work in motion, because we've been working at home and working in the office, and now we're having to start to think about what happens when we go between those environments and when we travel and when we're in the field. There, there's a much more dynamic sense of what's coming in 2022 and beyond. But of course, we have to lead for that kind of a more dynamic way of working. And that's what the last section is going to be. So let me just jump in and talk about some of the global disruptions that we're facing, because I think that that puts us all into perspective. There are a lot of challenges that are coming. You know, of course, there's employee safety, and we've all been very focused on that. And yes, it's from the pandemic, but there are also safety issues around weather events and other different types of challenges that come along that put employees at risk. And there's also data that's at risk. So what is the access that we have to data? Is it disparate and disconnected systems, or have we found ways to connect them securely? And the world is changing so rapidly that we have to keep pace with some of the legislative changes and the complex processes. Some of those are interoperability at a technical level, but some of them are legal distinctions that are shifting week by week and month by month. And cybersecurity takes advantage of trying to lock down the data and keep people safe. But there's always another change that's coming. And as we have all of this complexity, that is just ripe for cybersecurity to be put into place. So we have a threat environment that just keeps scaling the more we have complex reality. And of course, teams have not quite become as integrated as we need them to be. So when there are siloed teams, there isn't information that is shared in a timely fashion. Uh, there isn't the kind of collaboration and frankly, trust that needs to be at the foundation of resilient organizations. So this lack of trust is the last element that I think is really important for us to bring into the mix here because leadership has to be involved. We can say that we have a trustworthy group of people that are in our company, but we also have to have a technical foundation of trust to make that kind of organization work. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So this environment, these challenges, they really are inspiring new ways of working. And I think that's why we're all here today. We've seen in our own lives day to day, this accelerated digital transformation, the shift to cloud computing, the adoption of automation, new unified communication and collaboration tools. We've seen new work models that have come about, whether it's telemedicine or whether it's remote work or any number of other work models and business models that go with them. And those business models have transformed a lot of our policies and processes. What wasn't possible for us to do two or three years ago, we take for granted now. And I think a lot of them are gonna change. So at IDC, we talk about this as being a form of digital resiliency. In other words, we've always had business resiliency where, you know, operationally, we try to get things up and running as quickly as possible. We react with speed. Digital resiliency is going beyond that. It's not just being able to react, but being able to adapt, to be able to look at all these, these, these disruptions, be they technological, be they social, be they physical, and make the most of that be able to think about how these change conditions are going to lead to better business opportunity, better employee engagement. So the good news is that momentum is really building to support these more digitally resilient ways of working and things that people said they couldn't do, you know, two years ago, last year, they're doing them now. And we've seen that 34% of the, IO, the, the line of business and IT leaders that we talk to 
have said that they're expanding those resiliency plans, not only to support requirements of the pandemic, but to really think about future business disruptions. And it's that future business disruption element that we're working on today, I think. Um, one of the elements of that disruption that I think everybody is well aware of is remote and hybrid work models. And I bring that up because it was the top of the list of the enduring practices that our IoT and business leaders said that they thought would be coming out of the pandemic and it would be accelerating that digital transformation. But the thing is that that hybrid and remote model does not work unless we have all of these technologies to go with it. So we need to have intelligent digital workspaces for people to have hybrid work. They need a digital place to work if they're not going to be together in a physical place. They need to have access across time zones. They need to have access across devices and locations. They also need to have more cloud managed services and opportunities to work in ways that can scale and be dynamic. And automation is also part of this equation. Think of all of the different paper-based processes and old school ways of working that have transformed just in the last year and a half. And of course, people are starting to really reimagine and reconfigure physical workplaces to allow for us to have much more dynamic interaction between people who are located together in one room with people who are disparate across many different locations so that divide doesn't seem so monumental as we move forward. And the challenge that we face in this is again, not only in terms of the technology, uh, because we say, well, what what is hardest to do about all of this? And honestly, the hardest thing, I don't think anyone's surprised, is getting the support that's needed from IT. Because as we rapidly transform and have digital tools and technologies and different ways of working, it requires IT to support them. It requires secure remote access to that data, to the applications, to the content, and the ability to be, have visibility into where there may be security breaches or where there may be issues with performance. So all of these technologies in service of giving a seamless experience for employees are really important. Of course, they don't happen if you don't have internet connectivity, which sort of goes without saying, but I think it's important to remember because we take that for granted. But the other thing that we take for granted is that we could all magically work together seamlessly. And that is the biggest organizational challenge. So while we've messed it, everybody's comfortable with video chat and conferencing and instant messaging and other forms of communication and collaboration, that doesn't mean that teams are effectively working together. And that is an organizational and a leadership challenge. It means being able to establish trust as the foundation of the organizational culture so that employees can work effectively and feel like they have agency and that their managers trust them. And conversely, that leadership trusts their employees to work efficiently and effectively. And that extends to new hires, people who have never even seen the people that they work with virtually every day, for example. You know, as we expand the ways in which we work, we also expand the geographies. And that distance needs to be breached, not only technically, but socially and organizationally. So being able to evolve that culture and sustain that culture over time is a really important part of how we maintain resilient hybrid ways of working. So I'm gonna stop there because that was a lot to introduce everybody to and see if we have some questions, Krista. That's great. Thanks, Amy. And, and we appreciate those real data-driven insights based on IDC's research. Um, Eric, I wanna to turn to you just to get um, some examples from the Everbridge perspective. Um, is this just a technology issue or, or where are employees um, coming into the picture? Yeah, great great question, Krista. I think, you know, first and foremost, I, I, a couple of trends that Amy really hit on that I think we're seeing in our customer base as well at Everbridge. The first real key point is that, you know, this idea of organizational resiliency um, is really a top of mind, right? For most organizations now, we've seen a significant uptick um, in customers looking at that, um, both from a new perspective as well as how do they expand and get more proficient at sort of enterprise resiliency. And that means lots of different things because it's a journey. Um, and in fact, last year, you know, we were successful um, based on customer feedback in launching our enterprise resiliency uh, best in class 
project, which really brings best, best practices out into the field. Um, so I think that's one common thing I would say. I, the other element I think you, you hit well on, Amy, um, and there's so much good information here, is this idea of automation. Automation um, also really hits enterprise resiliency. And when we think about automation, you know, it's not just whether um, my Microsoft Word and sort of my office suite is, is enabled for me, right? Um, when we talk about enterprise re resiliency, that really, we're seeing a lot of our customers ask for more of what we would call hyper automation, right? Bringing both digital assets, physical assets and systems into both your planning, your sensing and your response um, to events that may impact your business operations. Um, particularly, you know, in the past that might have been digital servers go down and how do we detect that? And a lot of folks have done that kind of work, but we're seeing a lot more around wearable technologies. Yeah. Um, and COVID has brought the whole thing about vaccines and, and distancing and all those elements and many organizations really extending out to this idea of hyper automation and how it can be leveraged to really extend the capabilities of the organization. So I think those are a couple of ways that we see, we, we have seen it from uh, uh, our customer base. Great, all right, thanks. Um, Amy, you touched briefly, but I wanna probe a little bit further on um, the difference between organizations who are taking a proactive versus reactive approach. Can you speak to that in more detail? Yeah, and, and I think this is a, it's a challenge because why be proactive when we can just keep steady state? And that's, uh, I think, one of the, the biggest hurdles is the inertia. Um, so those that are being proactive are recognizing that if they make technology investments today, um, that they are able to do much more than simply course correct for anything that might come up that's anticipated. So that they are not only building a technologically resilient way of working, they're also building their business plan for the future. And where I see that working especially well is where there's an investment in the channels of communication, where there's an investment in the organizational change such that they have a much better sense of how are employees doing. And it's not just sort of the traditional, let's do a survey and see what people think. It's very much looking at where can we anticipate that there are going to be challenges, whether that be challenges in being able to service different devices or challenges in terms of employee morale or well-being or challenges in terms of attrition and keeping employees engaged because these are really stressful times. They're not just stressful to the business, they're stressful to the employee. Uh, and as such, that means that there needs to be a way in which you have your finger on the pulse on a regular basis for how the business is doing, how employees are doing. And those that do that and make those investments are not stuck scrambling after the fact if there is a big disruption. Again, it could be any number of different disruptions, but being able to have a plan B and a plan C and have everybody know how to engage and communicate I think is a really critical component of being resilient for the future of work. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Let's shift um, to talking now about more about what this will look like from an employee perspective. Yeah, and as I said before, I think employees are going from, you know, employee at the workplace or remote employee to work in motion, that work is happening at various points and, and locations throughout the day and throughout the year. Uh, and the notion of what it means to be hybrid is evolving as well. Um, people used to say, well, you know, are we going to be three days a week in the office or are we going to be traveling once a month, you know, those kinds of questions have really shifted toward assuming that most employees will have some degree of flexibility and their job remit will be in multiple places for multiple purposes. So as we think about that, this new reality is work in motion and it's across a spectrum of different hybrid models. And I share that because it's not about an end state. And I think this goes to your earlier question about what are more resilient organizations doing and what does that look like to be proactive instead of reactive. Proactive is to recognize there may be a variation in where the majority of employees work. They may be more on site or they may be more remote or they may be more dynamic between those two locations as part of their day-to-day -day experience. 
And that workforce strategy means that we have to have a flexible site strategy as well. And thinking about, well, how are we gonna use our buildings? And what is the remit for having occupancy levels? I mean, those are the kinds of questions that never were being asked, you know, just even a year ago. And we've looked at, well, what are the investments that those organizations are making? And it's very clearly safety first. It's very clearly security, but it's also looking at how do we reimagine an office from a static location that is just bound by each person in each cube or each office in each day. It's much, much more dynamic. And we're thinking about this in terms of reconfigurable offices. And why, why you would do that is you have to think about making this environment the most compelling possible to bring people together because there's a lot of fear. And I share here the statistic that 60% of our large enterprise companies are saying that they will require vaccines. And in many cases, legally, they have that as their obligation anyway. Um, but it's an important factor because if you want people to feel physically safe, um, you have to have those kinds of technologies that are going to help with attestation. Um, and you have to help with security to get people in those badges that was just my way in the door, you know, two years ago. Those include information on, am I well? Have I had my vaccines? Um, have I been tested? We start to see much more integrated and holistic ways of looking at technology in the flow of the office. And there are, of course, other technologies that have been around, like touchless doors and lights and wayfinding, because you know my office is not the office that I left two years ago or a year ago, and it may be different in two months or two years again. So having this habit of negotiating and navigating through physical spaces in a safe way, that's new. And I think it's a change for the better. It gives a lot more flexibility. And if you look at where the investment is, again, from a technology standpoint, the return to office really allows us to focus on employee health and well-being. Yes, now, because of the pandemic, but I think that extends to a much broader definition of those things in the future. So we're looking at using phones and wearables, as Eric was saying, for doing contact tracing today. Think about where we're going to start being able to use them to help with wayfinding and negotiating our spaces tomorrow. Think about the, the fluidity and the flexibility that we're trying to accomplish in having dedicated health and security apps. Those are for pe people being safe, um, and they're also for keeping people healthy and putting those two things together as an inalienable right for going into the office rather than feeling guilty about a sick day. And what's interesting is when we start to break the data down by different industries, for example, manufacturing, they're more focused on those health and security applications. But if you look at the services organizations, they're more focused on focus on contact tracing because of the proximity and the travel and so many people going so many places and having so many interactions. So it makes sense. There's not just a one size fits all way of thinking about a safe return to the office. Um, there are going to be industry preferences and there are going to be organizational preferences. So Eric mentioned automation before. Let me share with you a little bit of a day in the life here. You have people coming to the entryway. They've got visitor management if they're a customer and health screening if they're an employee. They have to have hoteling because they may not have the same desk as they did last time they were in the office. Um, you have contact tracing to make sure that if you did get close to somebody who has po tested positive for COVID or whatever the case may be, um, you're in a position to quickly identify and curb any of that contagion. And of course, a lot of negotiating through these spaces requires things like wayfinding because it's a lot of a waste of time. I'm sure everybody on this call has found themselves in some building going the wrong way down a one-way hallway that is is uh, filled with cubes and it gets confusing. You know, that kind of experience just puts an impediment in the ways in which we work. So if we can brush that aside, we have wayfinding for getting from point A to point B in our cars. Why not in our buildings? Why not on our campuses? Why not do that much more extensively and take that and bring it into the future way of working? 
And it also includes, I think, and this is an important bridge between our digital environments for work and our physical environments, having video messaging and enhanced AI enabled video conferencing that really allows people to feel like they are connected with others. Again, this is a cultural issue as much as it is a uh, technology issue, and it allows people to have the right resources to connect in the right way, in the right language, at the right time. And that is the holy grail of being able to address some of these teeming challenges that we face. So when we asked about this, and this is my, my last slide, but I think it's, it really brings us together, when we asked about what the investment would be in the next two years to have long-term resilience, uh, we found that the success of the business really, really lies on investment in digital trust programs, on security, privacy, and compliance. And it's not the only thing, of course, but it's a really important one. And it was important before the pandemic, and it's only become all the more important. So we see that 69% say that digital trust is a priority or top priority. And I think that this matters because uh, as a CHRO that I'm quoting here says, culture happens when employees believe that while their manager trusts them, they also have a team of individuals with whom they can collaborate and connect. And, and I think it's that collaboration, that connection, and that culture of trust that are really gonna guide us through the future of work and successful execution on hybrid work as we move forward. Excellent, okay, thanks again. Um, lots of very interesting insights. Eric, I'm gonna turn to you again. I know um, you've got a, a deep focus on people and life safety. Um, so I, I'd love to hear more again from an Everbridge perspective. What are customers facing as it relates to these topics? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, Amy has hit a, on a lot of key points that I think we also hear from our customer base. I think a couple of key takeaways, you know, that I particularly resonate from our customers, this idea of everybody being work in motion. And so it's not static populations. When And, and when you think about that from a safety and security perspective, right, that extends the envelope of how we traditionally thought about things where we might have people on site, with uh, sort of homogeneous groups of people working together in these locations. Now you have people fluid in motion all the time at a much higher level. And so I think we hear that challenge. Um, and we also hear the connection. And, and again, you mentioned trust, Amy. I think we recently did a bunch of work with customers around, uh, around employee experience and how much this ties into employee experience. And I know a lot of our customers are very focused on, uh, on employee experience, with, especially with large events like the great resignation going on. Um, and we've even had a, a customer, I, you reminded me of a quote of a customer who said, we're always recruiting our workforce every morning now, right? It's like, we're trying to engage them every morning. And that safety and security is really foundational to that. And so, you know, understanding how to extend that to obviously at home, which we talk about, but your field services organizations, right? People who are out in the field who might be servicing clients or visiting clients, travelers and, and, and long-term, um, you know, kind of assignments overseas. What does that look like? So that's certainly a technology challenge and as well as a service challenge, right? You might not even have the people to be able to provide services to those folks who are overseas, for example. So I think those, the idea of having um, both people and process and kind of tools all working together, um, mm -hmm. as well as these services is a key trend that we're seeing. And I think I've heard from a number of customers um, and I think that aligns well with what you're, you've been describing as well, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really, you mentioned the global uh, remit here. And I think that's very important as I do my research uh, around the globe and I have colleagues in Asia Pacific and Europe and, and, and in Canada and, and other parts of the world, we see very different circumstances on the ground in each of those geographies, um, both in terms of work styles and requirements, as well as you know political climates and, and geopolitical client, climates as well. So. I think that that's really important because there are a lot of large multinational organizations for whom uh, they're gonna have to do a different thing in each geography and they need to be prepared to be resilient and flex between those different models. Exactly. Great point. Um, 
Amy, I'd love to, to probe a little bit further on the topic of the great resignation, very top of mind, uh, it definitely in people's minds these days. And I think if we could go a little bit deeper um, and how this factors in, including, again, you, you touched on the connection between employee experience and how that impacts customer experience. And I think that would be a very interesting area to, to, to dive deeper into. Yeah, and I'll touch a little bit on it now, and then I've got a slide that I think will really uh, be interesting to share on that point. I mean, I think the focus on employee experience is long overdue. I think uh, everybody has been uh, very focused on the customer experience for so long, partially because of the retail industry, and think about the extension of that into healthcare and patients' bills of rights, and very, very uh, broadly speaking, uh, the customer has been the engine for the development of business. And it wasn't until the pandemic hit that people realized just how important employees were and just how critical they were. And we talked a little bit earlier about digital transformation and how rapidly that happened, whether it was automation or moving to the cloud. But as businesses become more digitally transformed, it creates a bridge, a, a connection point, an ability for the employee and the customer to be on the same playing field, to have the same access to the same kinds of dynamic ways of working, whether that be shopping or delivering services or being able to consume those services, it starts to level the playing field and gives you a sense of including the employee as part of the larger business strategy in a way that we have not seen before. And I think that helps to elevate the employee's sense of being part of the organization, yes, but also recognizing when they are not being treated as such. So that's part of what's going on. The stressors that we started this conversation looking at, again, they're affecting a lot of people so that the priority may not be work first, it may be life first. So how do you create a work environment in which that empathetic leadership is so critical to building a satisfied employee who is empowered and interested in engaging uh, such that you can start to drive better business results and outcomes and customer satisfaction. So um, I, think, I think that's really what it comes down to is we're starting to appreciate those things in ways that we hadn't before. And the good news is that there's an opportunity to alter the environment both culturally, organizationally, um, and technically to affect a better outcome for both employees and customers. Companies talk all the time about the, their employees being their greatest asset, and I think you're making some very good points uh, that really underscore how that is very just critically important. Um, let's let's shift into talking about implications for leaders, um, and you know what what do leaders need to be doing differently to engage and ensure resiliency and and, and being taking that more proactive approach that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, and I think, Krista, the important word you just said is leaders with an S because it's not simply a technology CIO problem. It's not just a CHRO, oh shoot, they're all leaving problem. It's, it's a full court uh, approach that needs to be in play here. These resilient work models that Eric and I have been talking about really require cross-functional leadership. Um, and, and you know, our, our research has shown no matter where in the globe you are, no matter whether you're small, a medium, or a large, or a large enterprise business, the CEO is at the center of that. And if you have a good CEO that understands how to work well with their team, that's a very good start. And we're realizing that every function, whether it's your operations or your technology functions, or whether it's you know human capital or security and risk, or even customer experience, they are all ultimately becoming technology functions, not because they are intimately tied to doing technological deployment in every instance, that's not the case, but because technology is touching all of them. If you think about how we've had to shift to remote onboarding as an example, and much more of a global assessment of which people are skilled and able to join an organization, HR has had to become much more adept at understanding data analytics, much more adept at having to understand uh, artificial intelligence. That's just in one area that traditionally was thought of as being very programmatic, very people-centric, but it's also becoming much more uh, technologically savvy. Um, and likewise, the operations leader, 
they typically would mind their knitting within the facilities and not think about some of these other things. But it's critical that they better understand the technologies that are going to be deployed in their buildings as part of an end user experience to go through those buildings as we were talking about before. And the, and the list goes on. I, I could spend a whole webinar just on this slide, but I promise I won't. Um, I think the important thing is we think about this team sport, this dream team of executives coming together to try and affect resiliency and work together, is that we're talking about not only that technological change around automated workflows and remote onboarding or AI with dynamic learning so that people can keep pace with all the technology change, as well as communicate and collaborate with the people that are important to them but also that we think about that dream team coming together because there are changes in the ways in which we recruit. And that has technology implications as well as people implications. That means that we need to have greater empathetic leadership for not only cultural differences, but looking at what it means to be somebody in that geography or somebody who is remote and somebody who is on premise. That didn't seem to be an issue before, but it is now when you have such distributed teams. You need first line managers that know how to engage, that have human skills to be able to bring people together even if they are geographically dispersed. And, and it's brought about, I think, a, an important integration of technology and organizational change in the form of agile work practices, where we are constantly and dynamically learning and iterating on the ways in which we engage. We stop and we reflect about what worked and what didn't. We have much more consumable ways of communicating with each other that are in real time to build those relationships so that the organization can be integrated. And I'm gonna bring it back to that uh, uh, diagram that I showed the model here and just give you a sense of it. If you think about the operational leader who's trying to reimagine the physical office space and look at where sensors are deployed for wayfinding, for example, and your human capital leader, your CHRO, who's thinking about how do I convince people to come back into the office? Do I make it voluntary? Do I make it mandatory? There are a whole series of questions of understanding you know, who in your employee population is at risk? How can you best reach them in the event of some sort of a crisis or in the event of needing to get them to come in or not come into a building? How are we gonna to respond to any sort of a disruption, be that a surge in pandemic cases or be that some other uh, situation that, that crops up? And how are people doing anyway? If their morale is down, they're not gonna particularly want to commute for an hour to get into the office. And you may be losing them soon if you're not providing new policies. And what are the resources that they need if they're not going to be physically in the office or if they are going to be going back and forth or they're changing their routes from a services and field perspective as, as Eric was saying. And then likewise, if you think about the conversations between your technology leader and your CISO or your chief risk officer, you know they are thinking yes about the IP of the company, but now when you think about all of the information for self-assessation and, and for being able to share vaccine information, there's a lot of personal information that's part of this equation. And who needs to be engaged in this conversation? Well, certainly it's going to be the CHRO, and they're going to have a much broader set of uh, data sources. That means greater complexity and greater exposure. And you know the degree to which you can automate all of that complexity and reduce some of those repeatable tasks so that the people can just be doing their jobs rather than worrying about what app is for what, it's going to give a much more holistic sense of how to keep the organization in play and in motion as, as we were talking about. And this is the, the money slide that I was uh, promising you earlier. Um, the reason this matters, why do we care? Well, of course we care about employees and that, that employee experience is really important for many reasons. But one of them amongst others is that we're seeing very clearly that this employee experience is directly connected to the customer experience. In fact, we see that 62% of leaders are showing a large or significantly measurable impact on customer experience based on improving their employee experience. And 30% of them see actually a defined causal relationship between EX and CX. And that's pretty important when you think about what you're doing to drive your business forward and the opportunity to 
have employees focused on what the outcomes are for customers and not just doing task-oriented day-to-day things that, you know, frankly, don't keep them as engaged as they need to be to move forward. And our research in yet another study showed that 85% of respondents agreed that if they improve their employee experience, they're going to see better engagement from the employee, yes, but also see that translate to higher customer satisfaction, higher revenues, and a better organizational outcome from a business perspective. So that, I think, is an important trend that we're going to continue to keep an eye on. And the good news here, again, I think, is that there is momentum, that 2022 has the benefit of all of our learning from 2021, and that we do see progress, that, you know, most organizations, and this is from line of business and from IT leaders that we surveyed, they see that their employees do have resources accessible to be able to do their jobs with minimal disruption. Now, of course, there are going to be internet outages. Of course, there are going to be servers that go down. Of course, there are going to be weather events. There are going to be things that disrupt it. But the point is that we're thinking proactively about this. And a lot of them are on their way towards building up this holy grail of experience parity so that We can ensure that workers are going to be able to have access when they need from any device, that they'll have a consistent experience so that hybrid has a fighting chance here. And I think that's an important takeaway because it is going to be with us, but it's going to take a while for us to adjust and calibrate to understand how to make this work and work well for the future. It's great. I, I love your money slide. I think it's not necessarily a surprise to people to, to see the connection between employee experience and customer experience, but it is great to see the data behind it um, and, and just how impactful and how related uh, those two are. So that, that's great. Eric, again, I want to turn to you. Um, you. You touched on earlier Everbridge's Best in Enterprise Resilience Program, and it would be great to hear a few examples specifically of, of some of the Best in Enterprise Resilience certified customers or, or, or organizations, I should say, and how they're demonstrating some of the principles that both you and Amy have been talking about. Yeah, no, great great question, Krista. I, and I think just just to piggyback on a comment Amy made, uh, and really our, the, the, what we've seen in our program is that, you know, what we're talking about here is a journey, right? Resiliency is a journey. Um, and I think we see many of our customers uh, moving along that path. I think the folks who are in sort of our uh, best in enterprise resiliency program are really at sort of the the more mature phases of of that journey. Um, And, you know, a couple of key things I think we see is thematic with those customers. Um, One is really this idea that Amy highlighted about uh, aligned leadership and and cross-organizational collaboration, right? So um, certainly we talked about the C-suite. Um, and in the past, all these elements, you know, would fall, IT would fall to the, I, would fall into the CIO, for example, or, you know, security would fall to a, a chief security officer, right? But this idea of not only cross collaboration um, at, the, at the C-suite level, as well as below that level, at, as we start getting down to VPs and directors, and really the collaboration and the organization responding together is one of the trends I think we see in, in our customers who are really achieving those highest levels of, of uh, best in enterprise resilience. And that spans multiple industries, you know, financial services and government sectors, et cetera. I think that's a common uh, takeaway um, along with that governance structure that goes with that, right? Putting a governance structure in place to help uh, manage through that on behalf of the enterprise, I think is, is one of the key examples. Um, and then it's certainly we've hit on a number of the technology and process examples. I think that is a common theme that we see in our most uh, mature customers, right, is that they have figured out how to align the people, processes, and tools into those goals. And really for them, and then it becomes more of other areas they can go into with those, with those capabilities. So there's a couple of trends that I think we've seen in that program. That's great. All right. Thanks, Eric. And Amy, um, what advice would you give to leaders that are listening today um, you know, to successfully implement some of these new ways of working? 
Well, I think uh, Eric touched on the one that was nearest and dearest to my heart because our research is showing that while the C-suite is working in very well together, there is a disconnect between the goals and objectives and strategies that are happening at that level and the actual implementation down the pipeline, down the food chain, if you will, um, in their organization. So we have really to focus on how do you take the integrated long-term objectives that are happening at the senior executive level and make those ways of working uh, and, and those tools that integrate and allow for more integrated ways of working a reality. Um, and I think that that's the hard, hard work organizationally to be much more opening to cross-functional collaboration in the day-to-day -day and not just in times of crisis. So really absorbing that as a way of working, an integrated way of working. And then the second is if they're not already doing so, to really seriously look at how to adopt agile work practices, because that's going to not only help with the cross-functional integration, it will allow them to rapidly iterate, to understand where there are challenges, what's working, what's not, to remove the obstacles of having a judgmental workforce where people are wrong and fail, to be much more oriented towards helping people to see where things are working and how they can improve. That's gonna help with employee experience, it's gonna help with business results, and it's gonna move us from this old sort of SLA model of looking at the, the stick rather than an XLA model that is looking at the carrot to bring together these employees working in a way that's towards the goals of the business and helping to, uh, to help us to have more of a future of work orientation. Excellent. Okay. Um, as we wrap up today's discussion, um, I just want to note uh, to, to, to folks on the line that we will be sharing the slides, including all the great data that Amy has walked through, um, as well as sharing Everbridge's paper on future of work. So look for that in your inboxes. And before we close, I'm just going to ask both Eric and Amy for any final thoughts, um, calls to action for our listeners. Eric, we can start with you. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of good information, hopefully, we've shared with all of you today. Um, I, I would say, you know, again, key takeaway for me is this is a journey. Um, and probably the, the most important thing is to get started. Right. And so if you're not already thinking about this in your organization, um, time to, this is a good opportunity to, to think through those processes and how can you get it initiated within your organization. So. Excellent. And my takeaway is to think holistically in terms of the technology and your organization so that you can be integrated and you can be agile, because that's going to be what we see as the future of work. Excellent. Thank you both for the time. This is a great discussion. and I think you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you. Thank you.